Um, first of all, I'll just explain. I'm flying solo today. Pastor Steve is involved in a business venture. Um, he has been through this whole week. He's been filming for um, coaching videos that he's going to be putting out for his new coaching company. And today was the last day of filming. So he sends his love and his blessings and he'll be with us next week. So I'm going to start by reading from Mark chapter nine, verses 36 and 37. It's speaking about Jesus and he's teaching the people around him. And he took a little child whom he placed among them and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome just me, but the one who sent me. And then there's a story in Mark chapter 10. So just the very next chapter, Jesus had said this to the people, whoever welcomes these children welcomes me. And so people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. They were responding to the thing that he had put out there, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and he said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then he took the children in his arms. He placed his hands on them and he blessed them. People were bringing to Jesus what was most precious to them. He was, they were bringing their children to him and asking for his blessing. But the disciples thought that Jesus was too important to be bothered with mere children. And they tried to push them away, like, don't bother the teacher. He has better things to do. He has more important people to talk to. Jesus ended up rebuking the disciples, not the people who brought the children. And he even elevated this status of the children. He told the people they should be like children in order to receive God's kingdom. What I think is really cool about this story is he saw the value in the children. He didn't see them as unimportant people. He didn't see them as too little to be bothered with. He saw value in them. And that's consistent with Jesus's character. He saw value in people that the world assigned no value to. Again and again, Jesus reached out intentionally and gave value and relationship to those people that the leaders of society had written off. He championed those who had no voice and looked out for those who were often overlooked. Children, women, sinners. And this isn't just consistent with Jesus, God incarnate. This is consistent with the record of God throughout scripture. Even in the Old Testament, God has a track record of paying attention to those that would normally be considered unimportant or of lesser value. In Old Testament law, God made special provision for the fatherless, for the widow, for the poor. All of these groups of people didn't hold a respected place in the society. They weren't the kind of people who could really contribute to society. They didn't have status. They didn't have a voice. In biblical culture and times, they couldn't really look after themselves. And so they didn't have any obvious value. Yet from God's perspective, each person, regardless of status or importance, each person holds inherent value. John 3, 16, we all know this verse very well, says that God so loved the world. That means each and every person, every single person, God loved each one so much that he sent Jesus. Pastor Steve has taught us that love communicates value worth and significance. So if God so loved the world, then he considers every person, all of us to have value, worth, and significance. Therefore, every person is valuable because everyone is valuable to God. And we learn from this story of Jesus and the children that we need to be careful that we don't weigh the value of individuals, we don't weigh the worth of someone else based on what they bring to the table. We can't value somebody just based on what they can do or what their status is. 
I want to read another story from um, the life of Jesus, and this is his teachings in Matthew chapter 25. I'm starting at verse 31. Jesus says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. He's looking ahead prophetically. We haven't, this hasn't been experienced yet, but this is the end of all times. We are going to see this. He says, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look af looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Whatever you did for the least of these, that takes me back to the story of the children. They were considered the least in their society. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. That's what Jesus said. And he said, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. So actually, we minister to God himself whenever we welcome or care for other people, especially those we might be tempted to consider lesser than or those that we might naturally ignore or pass by or disregard. Who are the ones that we pass by in our daily lives? Who are the ones that we think that we are too important to bother with? Who are the least of these around us? I want us to consider this, these questions firstly as a church community, as life is one. And first of all, I just want to say that I've seen through the years, I feel like as a church community, we actually do this very well. We extend welcome to anyone and everyone. Over the years, I have seen all different types of people come into our community and be embraced. We've welcomed the stranger, the college student, the family with young children. We've welcomed homeless individuals. We've welcomed people from any race, any background, any age, even the unbeliever. And as we prepare to regather in person on July 4th, I want us to remember this is who we are as a community. You know, one of our core values is home. As life is one, we want to create a home, first of all, to welcome the presence of God in our midst and that the Holy Spirit would feel at home with us, but also to create a home for every person who walks through the doors, whether they stay with us just one Sunday or they become part of the family. We still want everyone to feel at home with us. And that's a privilege that we have as the family of God to create an environment of home. So we can draw others into relationship with us, but more importantly, into relationship with God. Every time we welcome a person into our midst, it's as if we're welcoming Jesus among us. That's what he says. It ministers to him as much as it ministers to them. But also as a church, we've reached out beyond ourselves, beyond our walls, beyond our Sunday service to offer a cup of water, as it were, to the community around us. And we have ministered to the least of these as Holy Spirit has led us. We've been loving on San Antonio High School for the past few years praying for the school, tutoring the students. We've provided sports jerseys and school supplies, and we've supported the staff. We've partnered with Evelyn and Carol with a spa 
to minister to single parent families. We bought Christmas presents and wrapped them and helped with Christmas parties and outreaches and picnics. And we've cheered them on as they've led this outreach ministry. We've collected helpful items for the homeless, toiletries and socks. We had boxes of them at the church at one point, and we got together and we assembled these um, kits to pass out to people in need. And then Kelly helped us distribute them to the police department and other agencies who were meeting people in need in our community on a regular basis. Also, I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago for Mother's Day, we visited some of the senior homes in our community. And actually, one of those senior homes just reached out to us this past month and asked if we could help start a Sunday service for them. It's a great opportunity for us to be present with those who maybe feel like they're on the fringe of our society, who may feel like they're the least of these among us. So as we regather as a church and as we are renewed as a church family in the coming days, I want us to remember that this is who we are that we will continue to seek out the least of these, that we will continue to welcome people into our midst, that we'll look for people who are in need and see the value in them and care for them the way that God does. And we can do this together and have significant, significant impact because we're doing it together as a community, as a church family. And that helps us to serve in effective ways to the city around us. But I also want to approach these questions of who is the least of these from an individual standpoint as well. What about us as individuals? How do we serve, quote unquote, the least of these in our daily lives? This is about integrating our faith in our daily walk. So we're not just depending on our church experience and our, our Sunday gathering to lead us to people in need. This is the heart message of Ecclesia that we've embraced as a church family, that I am, you are, we are the Ecclesia. We're the family of God, the church of God, not just on a Sunday, but all week long. Not just when we gather in the house of God when we worship or here in the Zoom of God when we worship, but every single day, everywhere we go. These instructions of Jesus in the passages that I just read, they actually line up with the model of prayer evangelism that we've been practicing. That first of all, we bless, then we fellowship with, then we meet felt needs, and finally we proclaim God's kingdom. Blessing and fellowshipping, these equate with welcoming the least of these in Jesus's name, just as Jesus welcomed the little children. And Jesus describes meeting felt needs in great detail in that passage from Matthew as feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty person a drink, clothing the needy, caring for the sick, visiting those in prison, inviting people in. But just as expansive as this list is, I think Jesus was really only giving us an illustration of what it means to serve the least of these. I think the list that he gives us is a for example do these things. I don't think that it's meant to limit our creativity and how we reach out to people that are in need and the people around us. We could add to that list sitting with another person and, and hearing their story. I had the great privilege of visiting Betty Wolf last weekend. Betty celebrated her 90th birthday on Monday, and I wanted to see her, you know, around her birthday time and to celebrate her. But I sat with Betty for about an hour and she shared with me story upon story of Bible studies she used to lead and creative ways that God ministered his truths through her to other people. I was so enriched by that time. But at the end of it, you know, she grabbed my hand and she just said, thank you for listening to my story. And that was the gift I was able to give her for her birthday, just the gift of time and hearing her story. Sometimes that's enough, but it can also look like running errands for someone who doesn't drive, taking time to say hi to the grocery clerk and really asking how their day is going and, and hearing what they're saying, offering to pray for a neighbor if they tell you that their family member's sick, inviting an isolated individual to join you for a meal, 
helping clean up the yard of a neighbor who just doesn't have the time to do it. Even setting aside our own plans for one of our family members if we see that they need our help or our attention. Serving the people that God has placed around us, whether they seem important to us or not, whether they can pay us back or help us someday in return or not, even the least of these that show up in our lives. And the key to all of this, it's not really in the doing of the thing. The, the action is really the outcome. The key is partnering with the heart of God to see the value in each and every person, to communicate to them that they are seen, and then to minister to their need. It is a relational action, not a functional action. Last week in our breakout discussion time, um, we were asked to share about someone who had a positive impact on our lives. And I was reminded of a woman named Martha Everhard. Martha was the associate pastor of the church that my family attended when I was in college. So I wasn't there every weekend, but on the breaks and holidays, and occasionally I was able to worship with this church community. I actually served with the church for one summer. I served as a pastoral intern because I had a heart to be a pastor. And so I served under Martha's leadership and she also helped to officiate our wedding. She's a very special person to me. But before all of that, I first met Martha when I was in middle school. And my first memory of her was at church camp. I attended church camp every summer for a week, every summer from middle school all the way through college. And Martha was one of the camp counselors. And she was a favorite of all of the kids. She had a way of making every person feel seen and valued. And I could remember sitting at her table group at mealtimes. It was, it was like like a special, like you won the lottery if you got assigned to Martha's table. And I was at her table one summer and I watched as she could draw the most withdrawn, shy teenager, you know, arms folded, grumpy at the table. She could draw each one out and into conversation and make them feel important and special. With Martha, there wasn't even a thought of the least of these. Every person mattered to her. She saw every single one the way that God saw them. We get to share this love of God everywhere we go, but sometimes we hold back. I know I hold back. I know I'll speak for myself, but I think many of you feel the same way. Sometimes I just become overwhelmed with the need. Maybe the need of an individual. I think I don't actually know if I can help them, or I don't know if I can commit to helping them as much as they need to be helped. So I don't even step into it. Sometimes I become overwhelmed by the numbers. There's so many people that I know that need help. Where do I start? We think we don't have enough to offer. We don't have anything to offer. We make it too complicated. But you know, we don't have to have, and I'm speaking to myself, the solution to poverty in order to bless a homeless person in the moment. We don't have to minister to every single one of our neighbors in order to be the ecclesia to one person that maybe we meet on our daily walk. So how do we welcome people or meet those felt needs in Jesus's name? How do we reach out to the least of these around us? I want to finish just by sharing a few points to help us um, even just think in this direction. The first suggestion I would make is that we go with God, that we partner with the presence of God. And, and this is almost a shift for some of us. A lot of us start our day with God and we ask God to bless our day or to anoint us for the day. But I felt like Holy Spirit showed me sometimes we treat that interaction like when we were kids and our, our parents would send us off to school at the beginning of the day and they would stop at the doorway and they would bless us, but then we had to go do the thing. Sometimes we do that with God, like bless me today, but now I'm going to go do my thing. As opposed to God wants to go with us out the door. God wants to be partnering with us all day, every day. So take him with you and then pay attention to his leading. 
Jesus was surrounded by sinners and people with need. And literally every single person Jesus encountered needed what Jesus had. Every single person. But he only did what he perceived that the father was doing. So we don't need to be overwhelmed by the need around us. We just need to partner with Holy Spirit and pay attention to who he's highlighting for us. We need to learn to be sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then we need to be available. So we take God with us, but then we need to be available to be used by God. I feel like we need to shake off our COVID rhythms and COVID routines. We need to come out of hibernation. Okay, we've, we've had this time to be isolated and insular and care about ourselves and our own four walls, but we as a people tend to be self-absorbed and self-focused and COVID, COVID has made it even more so. So it's time to kind of lift our heads out of the sand and take a look around with Holy Spirit and do that relationally, not functionally. Don't just be like, okay, where do I have to serve? Where do I have to give this cup of water? Or who do I need to visit in prison? It's, it's not that. It's relationally. Holy Spirit, what are you seeing today? Who are you seeing? Show me who needs a meal, who needs a ride, who needs a friend. Um, Audrey, I saw Audrey over the weekend, and she was sharing with me. She was at, I think, Costco recently. And she saw these guys had just bought some really long something. She didn't even tell me exactly what it was, but it was this really huge thing. And they had this little tiny car <laughs> and she was watching them trying to maneuver this thing into their car. And she was driving a much larger like SUV vehicle. And so she actually walked up to them and said, how are you going to get that thing home? Like, where are you going? I, I could, I could take it for you. Like she offered, she saw the need and she offered. And in the end they didn't take her up on the offer, but I thought how cool that she saw the need and she stepped into that and she made herself available. Where is the need? And Holy Spirit, is there something you want me to do here? Or am I just seeing a need? And it's okay. Sometimes we just see a need and Holy Spirit isn't asking us to step into it. And that's okay too. We don't need to guilt ourselves out about that. That's that partnership, learning to track with Holy Spirit about what, what is my piece in this? And then learning to be quick to respond. I feel like a lot of times I see it afterwards. I'm driving away in the car and I'm like, oh, I could have been that person there <laughs> and I missed the opportunity. So being quick to respond, I think that requires us to set our heart in advance, to actually be prepared to be available and to be used. And so we need to go with God. We need to be available. And then we need to be willing to make a sacrifice if needed. It may be a sacrifice of our time maybe a sacrifice of our money, sacrifice of our comfort, of our routines. My very best friend lives in Canada. Her name is Julianne. And she and I ministered together at our local church when I lived in Canada for a very long time. There isn't anybody, I would say truly, out of that community there that I would rather spend time with than Julie. But we would intentionally, when we went to church gatherings, and we, would, we talked about this, we intentionally chose that we would not sit together, that we would not hang out together at a women's fellowship meeting or a church dinner or whatever, because we wanted to be available to the other people around us. That was a sacrifice to us because we would rather just sit and chat with each other, but we knew we could make time for that some other time. And we had comfort in our own relationship that we knew that we didn't have to be together all the time. So we laid that down to be intentional, to be there for other people, to look out for the people that nobody's sitting with, to look out for the person that nobody's talking to, to look out for the new person that literally doesn't know anybody. And so we made ourselves available. We were intentional and we made the sacrifice to do that. So go with God, be available, be willing to make the sacrifice and then lastly, and this may sound counterintuitive to, especially to us in America, but don't be so results driven. Don't be so results driven. The examples that Jesus gave, they were super simple, really. Give somebody a meal, give somebody a cup of water, go visit your neighbor, simple things. But he, even in those things, he didn't connect the dots to salvation. He actually just said, if you do that, you do it for me. In the prayer evangelism model, proclaiming the kingdom is the last step. 
But I think a lot of times we trip up over, how can I get this person into the kingdom? And we can miss seeing the value in the person and letting it be relational versus functional. I'm not saying salvation isn't the end game. Absolutely. We want people to come into the kingdom of God. We want them to be saved. We want them to have eternal life. Absolutely. But sometimes we have to just let moments play out and let relationship grow or not. We may just play a cameo role in somebody's salvation story. We may just show up once share the love of God with them, and then God uses somebody else to bring them into the kingdom, or he does it sovereignly. It doesn't depend on us. Don't let that stop you from reaching out and being there. Take it moment by moment with the Holy Spirit. So who is the least of us around us? Who is the least of these around us? I pray for us that as a church family, as a community, but also as individuals. We grow in our awareness of and our love in action for the least of these. I pray that we would be a community that shares the heart of God with everyone, the least of these included, in our daily lives and as a church in the city. I pray that we would be that church that would be known to love well in the name of Jesus. You know, we have this logo for life is one. Actually here, I didn't, oh, I don't have it on my cup. I thought I had it on my cup. But, you know, we have this logo of us praising God. It's, it's these hands in the air, worshiping the Lord. But the picture I had putting this message together was I also want to see us as a picture with our arms open wide to welcome and to serve, knowing that as we do so, we minister not just to the person, but we minister to God himself. Let's pray together. Lord God, you see the value in each and every person. And that's truly amazing. We confess, we struggle to do that at times. We get too busy, too self-consumed, and we judge people as important or unimportant, or we put them in categories of people that we like or people that we don't like. Please help us to have your heart for the people around us. Help us to be sensitive to you, Holy Spirit, so that we can bless, fellowship with, and meet the felt needs of others, proclaiming your kingdom ultimately, so that you are glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.